So uh, let's go to uh, House File 3. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Marks. And uh, welcome, uh, Representative Murphy, to the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, and uh, Representative Olson, would you uh, care to move the bill? Sure. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move that House File 3 be recommended to be placed on the General Register. Okay, the uh, motion is uh, before us, and uh, there is an amendment, uh, Representative Olson. Sure, I will also move the A20-0818 amendment for the author. Okay, that uh, motion uh, is uh, before us. Um, any uh, discussion on the amendment? Uh, Mr. Chair, I think there's a couple technical oh, amendments to that. Uh, but, yeah. We should take those uh, technical amendments uh, first. Representative Olson. Uh, so there are two technical amendments to the A20 amendment that we should do for the author. And so that's the A4 amendment to the A20-0818. And uh, to Chair Murphy, perhaps. Okay, Representative Murphy. Mr. Chair, it's a technical, A4 is a technical amendment uh, that we caught in the review. Okay, any uh, discussion? Uh, seeing and then all those in favor of the A4 uh, technical amendment signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Representative Olson. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, before you move on, my apologies. I had my hand raised. I don't want to interrupt, but. Oh, excuse me. Okay. Uh, being that we were on a technical amendment, uh, I forgot to look at the list. Representative Garofalo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. What is the technical amendment? <coughs> Representative. Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Murphy, he asked uh, what was the technical amendment that uh, we just yeah. voted on. Um, on page 74, after line four, there's a final enactment date. Uh, this article is effective the day following final e enactment. That was not in the bill and or in the amendment. Um, and then on page 45, line 23, um, there was a number, um, an incorrect number, 600,000 uh, should be 500,000. Representative Graffold, does that? Um, and Mr. Chairman, that, that amendment was coded A4. That's correct. And this is the A4 amendment to the A20-0818 amendment? That's correct. correct. Okay. Thank you very much. Representative uh, Olson, does that take care of the uh, technical amendments? There's one more, Mr. Chair, that I believe it's the um, A5. So it's the A5 amendment to the A20-0818 amendment. I believe Representative Marquardt was going to move that and explain it. Okay. So... Um, Representative Marquardt. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would like to move the A5 amendment to the A20-0818 um, amendment. Okay, the uh, motion is uh, before us, uh, Representative Marquardt. So what that does is uh, clarifies that the short-term rental portion of this bill uh, does not include homestead property. So it adds one word, and that is non-homestead to clarify that. So that was the agreement between the House and the Senate. Uh, the administration is fine with that. I talked to Senator Chamberlain last night, and he is fine with that. So that was the intent is not to include homestead properties, and we need to include the word non-homestead to make sure uh, that part is clarified. So I, I would ask member support. Okay, the motion is uh, before us. Uh, Representative Garofalo? Your hand was still up. Oh, sorry, my bad. Okay. Uh, any uh, discussion on the uh, Mark Ward Amendment? Okay, seeing none, then all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Uh, we now have. Um, Let's see, I'm just keeping track here of these amendments to the amendment. I think we're through the amendments to the amendment, are we not? Representative Murphy, I think we're yeah. ready. 
Representative Carlson, this is Nancy. Yes, we have Repres another. Representative Knorr has an amendment to the amendment, but that is, I, I'm not sure that's considered technical. So I don't know if you want to let yeah, Representative Murphy do it now or later. We're trying to take care of the technical amendments. And so I think uh, we're done with the technical amendments. So um, we um, have adopted the technical amendments, or no, we have to adopt the Mark Court Amendment. Oh, no, we did. We adopted the Mark Court Amendment. So now. Um, and the DE3 amendment we have to adopt. Yes. Or the so, as amended, yeah. A20. So, so uh, the DE3 amendment as amended is before us. Any discussion? Representative Carlson, this is Nancy again. I think it would be appropriate for Representative Murphy to explain what the amendment as amended is, because Representative Knorr's amendment still is to the DE amendment. So you can't do the DE amendment until you dispose of Representative Knorr's. Okay, so um, Representative Murphy. Okay, we're talking about the delete everything amendment, which is A20818, which is um, a different v version of uh, a conglomeration of bills that have been before you before. It is a jobs bill, a local projects bill, an emergency bill and critical economic development legislation that had space in House File 2529, which we had, uh, which is in Ways and Means from 2019. And then there has been a 2020 version of 2529, which came before this committee in May and uh, did not pass out of committee. Um, or it, um, it did not pass the floor. I'm sorry. It did pass out of committee. Um, it's a bonding bill, but as I said, it is a bill addressing immediate needs and emergencies in the state. It addresses local projects that we reviewed on um, 17 days of touring the state and meeting the people in their hometowns and listening to what the problems were in their regions and how they thought that their bills or their proposals of projects would strengthen the quality of life and Minnesota values in every single area of the state. This is I don't know what edition of the spreadsheet uh, this is. It's up into the 50s. Um, we've been doing new proposals based on the things I've already mentioned by the needs and wants and emergencies of the people of the state of Minnesota. And we're trying this way of addressing those at this particular time. And uh, it will work and it will put Minnesotans to work. It will strengthen our regions and will address some emergencies. GeoPart came through um, an agreement with the House Republicans. Um, first of all, you have to understand that it was it started out as a committee bill, uh, the Capital Investment 2019-20 Committee. Then after that, and after we were sent home, we had a we continued our work through this method, virtual meetings and um, negotiations. I had negotiations for over three weeks with Representative Erdogan 
and we came to a conclusion, a tentative agreement. Took that agreement into negotiations with over three weeks with Senator Sinjam in the Senate. And we came out with an agreement for $1.275 billion of geo funds. That is this bill. Plus, what was negotiated by with the four leaders with appropriation bonds, cash, and um, the other things that you see on the spreadsheet, which is um, dated to my, I believe, uh, 7-13-2020 at 12.02 p.m. And that's the spreadsheet that accompanies um, A20-0818. And that is what we have to decide on this morning. Okay, and uh, Representative uh, Murphy, we uh, do have one more amendment and that's uh, by Representative Knorr. Uh, if you're done, we'll take that amendment now. Representative Murphy? Yes, that's uh, fine. Okay, Representative uh, Knorr, would you care to move your amendment? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would like to move uh, A3 Amendment to A20-0818. Um, this is a small uh, amendment to uh, actually add homeownership as uh, uh, eligible uh, for the housing infrastructure bonds. Uh, we all know that uh, working families across the state um, need a stable, affordable entry-level homes. Uh, we have significantly uh, underfunded uh, homeownership um, at the state level. We all know that uh, the inequities that exist in our state, when you look at home ownership across all sectors, this is something that many people have asked us. We all know that home ownership means stable neighborhoods, stable schools, stable workforce. It also builds wealth. So we have to do the right thing to ensure that we don't exclude home ownership from the use of housing infrastructure bonds. So, Mr. Chair, this is simply um, an addition to the uses of the housing infrastructure bonds, which we haven't put any financial amount or anything. It's just allowing home ownership to be included. And uh, that's all we're doing. So I appreciate uh, if you will uh, support this amendment. Okay, any uh, discussion on the amendment? Representative. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair. Murphy. Representative Murphy. I don't, I don't know a whole lot about this amendment or where it came from, except that I know it's been in discussion in the housing committee um, off and on. The bonding people um, never discussed this and I wasn't aware of this amendment until late last night. And I haven't been able to talk to anybody about this amendment. So I would um, like some suggested uh, information from the housing chair, uh, Representative Hausman, on whether this is an idea that is wanted. And should there be a limit or up to a certain amount um, for home ownership. Because as Representative Hausman has said, will probably tell us that although this is the highest amount that um, has ever been suggested for um, home infrastructure bonding for houses, um, a hundred million dollars is short of what the groups that were working on housing, uh, 
they were asking for over $400 million rather than $100 million. And if we turn, if we add this home, um, this home purchasing in this hundred million, will all the money go for the, could all the money go for um, individual homes rather than the kind of um, projects that she's talked about before this committee before, such as the rooming house idea where everyone in the area has a, um, a bedroom and a bathroom, but there's common places for kitchens and so forth. So how does this fit in with the plans that the housing committee has recommended that we consider? Mr. Chair. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Chair. I hear, I hear a voice. Uh, uh, Representative Hoffman. Yes. Um, yes, Representative, Representative Murphy has outlined all the complexity of this issue. Representative Noor did talk to me about this last night. Um, the, uh, we, of course, understand the argument exa is exactly right for the, um, the use of to, to expand this. We had always hoped that we would have um, 400 million instead of 100 million, making added uses easier. But the way Representative Noor um, uh, drafted his amendment, he doesn't name any dollar amount. So it means um, in this transition, perhaps nothing would happen this first year. He just puts it in as an eligible use, but no expectation about any particular dollar amount. So I think for now, um, it would be uh, an appropriate amendment to add uh, and um, and doesn't um, it doesn't compete with with other projects just because we don't we don't say they must do some home ownership. Okay, uh, we do have two others that have indicated that they want to uh, comment about the amendment. I assume uh, Representative Graffel is that on the amendment? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. If I'm right. if we could just have right. nonpartisan. We could have nonpartisan staff in the amendment it references section 143 of the Internal Revenue Code. Can someone just provide a brief summary of what that means? I'm not sure who that would be directed to. Uh, is there someone uh, available uh, in the meeting that uh, could answer that question? Uh, Representative Graflo, I think maybe that's one that uh, we'll have to wait on. Uh, I don't see anybody uh, coming forward. Um, Representative uh, Draskowski. Mr. Chairman, if I could just follow up, my apologies. Um, so hey, I want to make sure I'm said we'd have to wait because we didn't have anybody online. But if you have further comment, go right ahead. Um, if perhaps Representative Hausman or the author of the amendment could explain what that portion of the amendment means. Again, I'm just looking at page one, lines 22. It says finance the construction or rehabilitation of single family homes. Houses that qualify for mortgage financing with the meaning of section 143 of the Internal Revenue Code. And so if perhaps Chairman Hausman or Representative Norrick just, that seems to be the you know, a substantial portion of the amendment if there's someone who just at least talk to that. Uh, Representative Noor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Representative uh, Graffel, I think this is in regards to the bonds, uh, for the mortgage bonds. So uh, I believe we do have uh, the, uh, the staff uh, from House Research uh, who can really uh, explain that whole uh, section. Um, I don't know if uh, Deb uh, is available to answer that question. Deb Dyson, sorry. Um, Ms. Dyson. Uh, um, Mr. Chair, Representative Nora, Representative Garofalo, um, I actually cannot explain. I don't know the um, IRC code um, or the Internal Revenue Code section reference. I'd have to look that up. So. Okay, so Mr. So, Mr. Chairman, what, I, what I'm assuming is that this is basically a language, this is language that would use MH, MHFA funds to encourage home ownership as opposed to the current 
structure of MHFA, which tends to put the thumb on the scale for uh, rental housing. Uh, assuming that is the intent of this language, then I'll be supporting it. Uh, if it turns out that this section 143 of the Internal Revenue Code references something else, then uh, of course, uh, that'll be, have a different meaning and should be subject to change later. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Skowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm trying to understand this amendment as well. It, um, it appears that we're creating a new precedent here. Um, that we're, we're creating a new qualification for the use of these monies. Um, uh, is there, do we have any, any precedent in law for um, taxpayers paying for uh, personal homes for people? Um, Representative uh, Houseman, uh, do you have any thoughts on that? As chair of the Housing Committee, uh, this is a new area, um, and uh, really, um, it would have been if we had had a traditional um, session, we would have probably had a hearing on this because this is uh, there are a group of people who have been working on um, uh, establishing this new use for some time. Um, but it, it, we really didn't ever, this would have been one of those bills that we would have heard in committee had we had a, a traditional um, session, which we did not. And so um, it, it hasn't gone through the, the normal process of um, conversation. Mr. Chair, if I could, could I add, jump in on that question? Uh, Representative Liebling. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, actually, maybe I even ask, Representative Marquardt to answer because taxpayers pay a ton of home ownership through mortgage interest deductions. This is uh, something that it, it's like a hidden subsidy, but it's enormous. And um, so I don't know the merits of Representative Noor's bill. I'm not jumping in on that. This is kind of not my area, but you know, let's not I, I just that's just an amazing question to me from Representative Dreskowski because yes, this is there's total precedent for this. I mean, uh, um, just it's just absolutely enormous. And so I think we, maybe part of where Representative Nora is coming from is that you know people who are not able to be in the housing market don't get to benefit from this enormous taxpayer subsidy. And they are left out, and this is part of why we have this enormous racial inequality. It's it's part of this inability to build wealth, which uh, we tend to think, oh, I'm a homeowner, I did it all myself. No, you didn't. You did it with enormous subsidies from the taxpayer. So, um, if I know that we have uh, Representative Marquardt has much more expertise. I don't know if he's prepared to speak to this, but I just couldn't help but throw that in. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just I might chime in to some degree. Uh, I'm old enough. Uh, my father was a World War II vet, and uh, mm. there uh, were various uh, ways to help people uh, purchase a uh, home as part of uh, the benefits uh, of having served during World War II. Uh, special interest rates, uh, nothing down. Um, there were uh, various options available to the uh, to the vets. Um, so, um, uh, Representative Skowski, you still have the floor. I don't know if that answers. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chair. Uh, well, uh, it really doesn't. The discussion's interesting, and of course, I expected nothing less, Representative Liebling, to, than trying to uh, trying to equate this to uh, uh, to those deductions. Um, but uh, this is actually uh, uh, the government. Uh, taking taxpayer money from people and then uh, turning around, or in this case, borrowing money, um, and then taking taxpayer money to pay for that borrowed money. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, doing direct infusions of money to uh, selected uh, individual homeowners, the way it looks to me. I'm just curious, Mr. Chair, uh, maybe Representative Murphy has the answer as to whether this um, this amendment was part of the agreement with the Senate um, because this is a significant uh, policy direction change uh, that I suspect the Senate might not be in concurrence with. Uh, Representative Murphy. Mr. Chair, I was not part of the agreement with the Senate and um, we did not talk about housing at all. 
with the Senate. We talked about geo bonds only. And um, this comes from house infrastructure bonding and um, uh, appropriation bonds for housing. Um, I, I, uh, like I said, I didn't, I don't know about this. I didn't know about this at this time. And uh, I think um, if it goes on in this committee, then um, it could also come out on the floor if we find in sub subsequent days uh, where it's sitting and we get more input from people that know a lot more about housing than I do. Um, it could come out and I would hope that Representative Knorr um, would um, be willing to um, consider that at that time if we have a um, massive advice on whether this should be part of the law or not. Mr. Chair? Um, I hear a voice. But, uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, Draskowski. Representative Draskowski, okay. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Representative Murphy. Um, yeah, I, I think you're, I, I think you're onto something there. I, I, I think the, I think the Senate will have um, large reservations with this. I don't know how large, but I suspect they'd be uh, large amongst their members. Um, uh, just wondering, or actually would like to request a roll call on the amendment, Mr. Chair. Thank you. A roll, roll call is requested. Um, Representative Dabney. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to thank Representative Noor for bringing this amendment forward and urge its adoption by members. Uh, Representative Liebling touched on uh, Representative Drazkowski's question about subsidizing home ownership, uh, but she, uh, while she was right, she wasn't uh, complete in how taxpayers subsidize home ownership. Uh, the mortgage interest deduction is, is a significant uh, way that uh, homeowners benefit. Uh, we subsidize roads to new developments rather than asking those new home, home developments to pay for the cost of the new roads. We subsidize uh, water infrastructure to serve uh, those new developments rather than asking the developments and the homeowners there to pay the cost of their own water service. Um, we allow uh, every year mortgage owners to deduct the uh, real estate taxes or homeowners to de deduct the real estate taxes that they pay from their taxes. These are all ways that we uh, subsidize home ownership in the state through tax dollars. Uh, the chair was good enough to, to bring up the VA loan program after World War II. Uh, chair has a couple of miles on me, but uh, not as many as, uh, uh, not enough to not also have a father who was a World War II vet, who uh, when he returned and married my mother was able to get a VA loan for a nice little house in the suburbs. And I'd remind members that people of color were not allowed VA loans, even though they were veterans who had served this country as uh, admirably uh, as any of their white uh, peers in the military. So we have built a infrastructure in the state and nation that makes home ownership available to some, subsidized by all, and much more difficult to achieve by others. Uh, this uh, inclusion of home, home ownership as a possible use of these funds is an important part of ensuring that we have a spectrum of opportunities for uh, housing for uh, Minnesotans uh, across income and across race. We do have the largest gap in home, home ownership between uh, African-American community and the white community in the nation. Uh, and while these funds are not earmarked for any one racial or ethnic group, uh, I think making home ownership more available to people uh, benefits all of us and uh, hopefully can go to helping close that racial gap. I think any other uh, 
act on our part would uh, be very telling. With that, Representative Noor, thank you for the amendment and I urge its adoption. Thank you, Mr. Chair. What, what I'm going to do, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning- <laughs> Mr. Chair, I did, I, Mr. Chair, I don't know if, you have, if you've seen my raise of hands. Uh, I haven't uh, seen your hand, but I was just, if I could complete my comments, I was gonna say that uh, I'll, uh, I was gonna ask the two relevant chairs to comment before we vote, but I do have Representative Hurtas and Mariani uh, with their hands up, and then I'll call on Representative Houseman and Representative uh, Murphy for uh, advice uh, to the um, to the committee, and then we're going to vote because we do have that uh, tight timeline. So people could be brief. Representative Hurtas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, there's little to disagree with uh, regarding uh, Representative Noor's comments about uh, what home ownership does in terms of creating stable housing and stable communities, and it's it's good. Uh, this is an area that I've spent my life in, and there's been quite a few comments made just of recent that I just wanted to address. First of all, uh, yes, there are uh, those public policies that incent home ownership through mortgage interest deductions. We also uh, help people who are not homeowners with the property tax refund or the renter's credit uh, through our Minnesota system. We also have uh, comments made with regard to the development community. And I just wanna make it categorically clear as a developer, no, uh, the streets are not subsidized when we plat and uh, create a neighborhood. They're paid completely for by the developer and de dedicated to the community uh, thereafter. Um, that is, of course, uh, built into the cost of a lot that the streets and the lateral infrastructure that is paid for by the developer is included in those lot prices. So uh, yes, there are arterial roads, county roads, uh, collector streets and whatnot that sometimes need to be expanded as a result of development but that is um, uh, simply you know, not the case with regard to uh, the development community having their stuff subsidized. Furthermore, the infrastructure with regard to those homes are served by what are known as enterprise funds. That's your monthly water bill and your sewer bill. And those things are usually segregate from city budgets in that those are self-funding with regards to long-term maintenance. So that is uh, something that I, I wanted to bring up with regard to the issue of housing. And uh, we have had in the past, and I think we still continue, Rep. Hausman probably is knowledgeable about this, but we have had programs for first time home buyer money, uh, which is helping people gain access to owning a home. And um, I think uh, just to close, uh, it's important when we're concerned about affordability and housing affordability that when we move forward <clears throat> as a legislature, we consider everything that we have endorsed or helped or, or supported with regard to the cost of housing legislatively. We continue to drive up the price of housing at the local level and even at the state level by issuing mandates of what must be included in the mousetrap, building a better mousetrap. And inherently, there's special interest that is always involved, whether it's uh, fire sprinklered homes or uh, air exchangers or the level of, of uh, codes that basically add more cost to the home. All of these things make a difference. And, uh, you know, things have changed a lot. Even since uh, 2000, uh, you could buy a lot in Brooklyn Park, for example, a second suburban ring, in 2000, you could buy a lot for less than $50,000. Today, it's triple that. And so a lot of it has to do with the regulatory process, and we should all have our eyes open with regard to the cost of housing when we take up issues on the floor that uh, start to increase housing. Because it doesn't just end with cost. It has to be return on investment. Then there is additional percent multipliers that go on in the closing transaction, whether it's mortgage registration tax, the deed tax, a number of other factors, uh, sales commissions, all of it has a multiplier effect of driving up exponentially the price of housing. So things have changed a lot uh, during my career. Uh, I was selling homes in the suburban Plymouth for complete for 89.9. 
you know, curb and gutter, city street. Uh, you couldn't buy a lot in Plymouth for under $200,000 today. So that's just the realities of the marketplace, but we should do better uh, in to encourage home ownership. And I agree with uh, Mr. Noor that home ownership is uh, good for the community. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, uh, again, I'm asking people to be brief. Um, it's not that uh, people aren't saying important things, but uh, uh, we do have a, an agenda that's before us that's pretty ambitious. If I, if, if I, if I could, Mr. Chair, I have some advice from the department that might uh, help us in the conversation right now. Uh, I was going to recommend you uh, after Mariani, but if it's important right now, uh, Representative Hausman, I was going to ask. Yes. Um, wh while we have been in, in this conversation, I've been hearing from uh, Homes for All and the department and, and the governor's office. Uh, the, the, the Ryan Baumtrog from the department uh, specifically called me to say there is something in the tax bill for this very purpose. And so uh, I suppose that's the dilemma with bringing an amendment um, to a, a negotiated agreement in committee. And Representative Noor, my advice to you, the, the department would like to work with you before we get this to the floor uh, to help you understand what's in the tax bill for this very purpose. So I don't know if, if you would be willing at, at this point to withdraw the amendment until the department has an opportunity to have a conversation with you about um, the tax bill. Representative Noor. Representative Noor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm willing to take that suggestion. Yeah, right. the question. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, um, I'll take that as a um, way looking forward to ensuring that home ownership is included. Uh, and I know uh, this is an important issue. Uh, we cannot only be looking for those who are, you know, within the system, those who are well connected, those who can advocate themselves to get what they really want out of this. This is more about building uh, that inclusive uh, system. So if this is going to solve the problems that we're looking at, if this is going to provide the opportunity to so many people across the state, uh, yes, I'm willing to withdraw, but I'm, I can assure you that this is going to be a discussion uh, that we will continue to have. Um, I know many people see as a handout to people when we're when we're talking about uh, you know in the, uh, big constructions, those who are within the system, we don't see that. You know, when we give people big tax deductions, we don't see that. But I think when we're trying to help the regular people on the main streets, uh, we tend to forget about them. Uh, and this is something we have seen repeatedly uh, over and over again. So with that, Mr. Chair, uh, I don't know if uh, Representative Mariani wanted to give some few inputs uh, uh, before I withdraw the amendment. Uh, I know he has been raising his hand, uh, but I just uh, I will entertain the request to withdraw at this point. Okay, uh, there's more than one hand that's up, but uh, if the amendment is withdrawn, I would just as soon move on. But I did reference uh, Representative Mariani before uh, Representative Hausman uh, spoke. Uh, uh, and then uh, we'll view that the amendment is no longer before us, but with the understanding that uh, there will be continued uh, work with the Housing Finance Agency and I think our two chairs and perhaps even with the discussions uh, relative to the bonding bill with the Senate. So um, with that, uh, Representative Mariani, are your comments still yes, necessary Mr. being the amendments being withdrawn? Well, uh, Mr. Chair, I'll try to be brief. I, 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 I think what I heard from Representative Knorr is that he wanted to hear some comments that he would entertain withdrawing it, so we should get clarity from him. But let me just say very quickly, uh, the tax bill provision is a $4 million provision. Uh, Representative Knorr is looking for something much more meaningful, quite frankly, uh, than that. And, you know, if it turns out that that's the issue, we can always pull this off on, on, on the floor. But missing an opportunity here would, would not be good. Let me just say, you know, um, in addition to everything everybody talked about, breaking the cycle of the need for subsidized rental homes, because we're caught in that cycle. One way to do that is to get people into their own homes. And there actually are, to represent Juskowski's question, it actually was a good question. There are ways in which you can do that, which maintains the integrity of the public purpose for public bonds. One of the ways you do that, I know because I was the chief author back in the 90s on this, 
is through a land trust program, where the land upon which the residence is held or, or, or resides or rests on uh, is held by a local public entity. That then would fulfill the, the, re the appropriate requirements about public purpose uh, for bond. So the owner owns the residence uh, it itself, has home ownership, obviously doesn't have as much equity as another owner, but we're talking about low-income folks able to get into their homes and not continuing to feed this you know, uh, expensive need to keep building you know, multi-unit uh, uh, units. The, the land that is coveted it over a very long period of time, I think typically 99 years, to be held in trust, so easily meets the public uh, uh, purpose. The point is, members, that there are creative ways in which this indeed can be done uh, without even all the other issues that, that we talked about that maintains a pure integrity of, of bonding for public uh, property itself. I think those are the kind of creative possibilities that Representative Noor is really urging and pushing you know, for our housing uh, pu public sector to really be about, uh, you know, there are GOP supporters uh, for, uh, for this provision. Um, uh, some of the advocates have had some very good conversations throughout uh, this session with majority leaders over in the Senate. So I wouldn't uh, automatically think that this is gonna be a partisan issue at all. I think there's strong GOP interest, just as there is strong VFL interest and really trying to break the cycle of getting people into properties that they own, uh, at least the residencies, uh, as opposed to continuing to feed this, this very expensive multi-unit um, uh, enterprise, which is needed, uh, but we should use every tool before us. So I would really encourage Representative Noor to go forward uh, with his amendment. If there's new stuff that arises, we can pull it off on the floor of the House, but if we pull it now, we're not gonna have this conversation. Uh Representative Noor, uh, I interpreted your earlier comments that you were withdrawing the amendment. Uh, Representative Mariani, at the beginning of his comments, asked for uh, clarity. Is the amendment withdrawn? Um, Mr. Chair, I think uh, that clarity was uh, presented by uh, Carlos Mariani. I said if we listen to him, because he's been involved in this issue for a long, long time, I think I will... Uh, you know, take that advice as we need to have the conversation. This amendment, I think for now, uh, I will uh, really uh, urge you to support it uh, so we can continue to have the conversation, look through the details, and if there's anything that presented that we can actually uh, uh, address the home ownership, then that's a different discussion. I think at this point, uh, based on the conversations we're having uh, with Carlos uh, Mariani's input, Let's have that uh, uh, in the bill and let's uh, look forward and I'm willing to withdraw it at a different time. Uh, uh, so let's vote on this amendment members and let's have that conversation uh, before the bill comes to the floor. Okay, members, uh, I indicated at the beginning, we're on a very tight timeline. Uh, the house rule is that uh, the committee reports have to be filed by one o'clock. We're going into session at five. Uh, this amendment uh, we've spent a lot of uh, time on already and a number of hands have uh, gone up um, and uh, the amendment is not withdrawn. Uh, I did say that I would like to have final comments by the two relevant uh, chairs, um, Representative Murphy and uh, Representative Hausman uh, before we, uh, we vote. Uh, are the hands that are up absolutely necessary to contribute to the dialogue considering our timeline? That would be Representative Garofalo, Keisha, Keisha and then I was going to represent it, going to represent uh, Houseman. Uh, Representative Garofalo, if you've got comments, if you could be brief. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that we're interested in brevity, but I mean, these are DFL amendments that are being forward on, being brought forward on DFL bills and they're DFL members talking. So I hope you understand that. I share your goal of getting things done in a hurry, but let's uh, make sure people are being allowed to talk. Um, in case yeah, I wasn't thinking about either side of the aisle, Representative Graflo. I was just interested in the timeline. Representative Graflo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in, in case anyone participating in this uh, discussion cares about things like facts or data, uh, people should know that the home mortgage interest deduction, that's something that 
was relevant in the past. It's no longer relevant. Over 90% of American taxpayers now file with a standard deduction. So the itemized deductions uh, don't matter. Uh, the second point is, is that with all this discussion that's going on today, uh, these amendments are on a bill that does not have the prerequisite votes needed to pass on the House floor. So um, I heard people use the term um, negotiated agreement. Uh, I just want to wave my hands and remind the House DFL that there are non-DFL members in the House of Representatives and you need our votes to pass this bill and we're not voting for it because you continue to refuse to negotiate with us. So you can have these John Adams debating society talking points as long as you want, but you don't have the votes to pass this bill. And just a friendly reminder of that. Thank you. Representative Krishan. Uh Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I echo what Representative Garofalo said, and I would just bring up, Representative Nor, you have something here. Um, and in my short time at the legislature, I've learned you never go backwards, you always go forward. And I'm glad Representative Mariani stated his support that we should vote on this and keep it on because we can work on that at a later date. And I just wanna make sure that we're absolutely clear that this amendment is going to be voted on. And Mr. Chair, if in fact, uh, and I, I do not believe Representative Nor is withdrawing it, but I wanna make sure that we're clear. If that was withdrawn, I would support offering your amendment, Representative Nor, to keep it moving. But I believe it's moving. And I look forward to voting on that. He uh, clarified that uh, the amendment is still before us. He hasn't technically withdrawn it. So uh, uh, that's the situation. And uh, for uh, I would like to hear concluding comments uh, from the two relevant chairs, uh, Representative Houseman and then Representative Murphy, and then we'll vote. Representative Houseman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I've been getting a steady stream. If we were in a, um, a committee room, there would probably be some people coming uh, forward to the uh, testifier table uh, to make some clarifying comments because there's a lot of confusion over this uh, from the people who are listening. And, uh, and I'm getting uh, messages like, uh, FYI, land trusts are already in eligible use, the land anyway. So the dilemma with an amendment like this at this particular time, the timing is just uh, uh, wrong, but I, I, what I know uh, will happen after this meeting is Representative Noor will sit down with, um, with the department and others uh, to clarify um, what's intended here and, and how that will relate to what's in the tax bill. So um, it just a, a, always a, a confusing way to, um, <laughs> to, to add to a bill, I think. But just so that you know, there are a number of people who are um, observing some complications with it. Representative Murphy. I'm not on the committee, Mr. Chair, but if I was on the committee, I would vote yes. Okay, uh, you are the author of the bill, however, so uh, your input yes. is not... Uh, as, I said, as I said 20 minutes ago or so, that if it's on the bill and we find that is not going to be workable. We can take it off when it comes to the floor. Okay, so uh, those are the uh, concluding comments. Uh, the clerk will take the roll. Representative Carlson? Aye. Carlson, aye. Representative Olson? Aye. Olson, aye. Representative Garofalo? Aye. Garofalo, aye. Representative Albright? Aye. Albright, aye. Representative Bernardi? She has her uh, thumbs up and aye. Bernardi, aye. Representative Davids? Representative Davids? Aye. Davids, aye. aye. Representative Daphne? <laughs> Daphne, aye. Daphne, aye. Representative Dreskowski? No. Dreskowski, no. Representative Eklund? Eklund, aye. Eklund, aye. Representative Hamilton? Hamilton, aye. Hamilton, Hamilton aye. Hamilton, aye. Representative Hansen? Hansen, aye. Hansen, aye. Representative Hausman? Aye. Houseman, aye. Representative Hurtas? 
Pertoss, aye. Pertoss, aye. Representative Hornstein? Hornstein, aye. Hornstein, aye. Representative Kresha? Kresha, aye. Kresha, aye. Representative Liebling? Liebling, aye. Liebling, aye. Representative Lilly? Lilly, aye. Lilly, aye. Representative Long? Aye. Long, aye. Representative Mariani? Mariani, aye. Mariani, aye. Representative Marquardt? Marquardt, aye. Marquardt, aye. Representative Nelson? Aye. Nelson, aye. Representative Noor? Aye. Noor, aye. Representative Pulowski? Pulowski, aye. Pulowski, aye. Representative Poppy? Representative Poppy? Poppy, aye. Poppy, aye. Representative Schumacher, excused. Representative Scott? Aye. Scott, aye. Representative Torkelson? Torkelson, aye. Torkelson, aye. Representative Vogel? Aye. Vogel, aye. Representative Waginius? Aye. Waginius, aye. 27 ayes, one nay. Okay, the motion uh, prevails. Uh, the amendment is adopted. Um, any uh, further discussion then on the, uh, on the amendment as amended? Seeing none then, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Um, we, uh, if we could have some concluding comments, uh, we haven't heard much from Representative Marquardt yet, uh, but uh, Representative Marquardt and Representative Murphy, if you'd care to comment uh, in conclusion about uh, the bill before we vote. Representative Marquardt. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, so uh, the- I need a number. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairs. So, uh, members, the tax portion of this amendment uh, does very much what the bonding portion of the bill does. It involves local projects and also provides uh, critical economic uh, investments and will boost a very fragile economy. And that's what uh, this tax portion of this amendment will do. Um, I'm going to just briefly kind of go over the provisions, but the biggest part that has been agreed upon uh, between uh, the uh, Republican controlled Senate and a Democratic controlled House, uh, the biggest part is the full conformity to full Section 179 expensing. And one of the things, the first bill we heard in tax committee this year in the House dealt with something that involves like-kind exchanges. Back in 2017, when the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was passed by the federal government, they said on like-kind exchanges, that's where if you were to trade in a piece of equipment and buy a new one, that before the trade-in value, so if you bought a new tractor for $200,000 and traded in the old one for $100,000, before the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, you would not have to recognize that $100,000 that you got on the trade-in. Um, after that tax uh, bill, uh, now you had to recognize that. So you now have to recognize $100,000. Well, that started for tax years 2018. And so the federal government, they did full section 179 expensing. So uh, even though you had to recognize a $100,000 gain, you also got to deduct and depreciate all in the first year the $200,000. So you did not have an extra cost. In fact, you would see a benefit. Well, last year, uh, while we did a lot of things in conformity and did a lot of things in a tax bill, kind of one thing that was not kind of finished was full conformity to section 179. And so what happened this year is that farmers and small businesses saw the gain from the like kind exchange, but because Minnesota only allowed a deduction of 20%, basically in the first year, 
the gain was greater than the depreciation or the deduction. And you found out that some small businesses and, and farmers got this bill for 2018 and 2019. They, they did what they thought was right under the um, current laws, but then because of the nonconformity, it created a problem. So this has been kind of the number one goal was to solve this this year. This bill solves that because what it does now is that on the like kind exchanges, going backwards, the 2018 and 2019 tax years, you will have full section 179 conformity. So now for 2018 and 2019, small businesses and farmers will get the same treatment as they do now under federal law. So what this does, section 179 will only apply retroactively 2018 and 2019 to the like kind exchanges. But moving forward, tax year 2020 and beyond, uh, full conformity to section 179 will apply to all of those uh, purchases of equipment and so forth. And so uh, this will provide significant benefit to farmers and small businesses around the state. And this has been a number one goal uh, from a lot of members throughout, throughout the state is to get this section 179 full conformity completed and this bill uh, and this amendment will do that. And it's been many, many years where efforts have been tried to get this done. And we are now very close to being able to do that. So basically 90 million of the $99 million cost of this bill in this biennium is the conformity to section 179. Uh, so other areas of the bill I'll just go over kind of briefly is uh, there, the student loan credit now is refundable. This makes it refundable. So while the payments on those loans have been suspended, they're going to come back. And with a slow economy, you got people who, if it's not refundable, they're not going to get as much on this credit. By making it refundable, they will, even though they're not making much income because of the economy, this will really benefit uh, those students and other people paying those loans. Uh, there's also a reduction in the combined net receipts tax, and this is for uh, poll tabs, electronic poll tabs, and so forth. Uh, this will allow these organizations to have more money in their pocket to give out to uh, various uh, areas on contributions and various charities and so forth. Um, something that was talked about earlier is there is a $4 million transfer from the mortgage registry and deed tax, deed tax that would go into workforce and affordable housing. So the way that would work is um, there'd be a home, home ownership development account that would be established in the housing finance agency. And $4 million from that mortgage registry and deed tax would be transferred each year. And that would be for 10 years. So it's for workforce and affordable housing. And, for, and it would be for grants uh, and loans. Um, some of the other things in the bill is there's sales tax exemptions, refundable exemptions for public safety facilities. There's a number of those there. Uh, there's a proportion that would enhance school equalization aid on operating referendums that would get out to more lower tax based uh, school districts. Uh, there's some fixes in the bill, uh, a school fundraising fix that will uh, help uh, groups. Uh, the short term rental, that was kind of a big one. What's agreed upon is that if you have a rental now uh, four units or less than four units and uh, you rent it for more than 14 days, uh, it would move into a 4B classification at 1.25%. Um, the partnership question has been answered here. I know that's a little bit of inside baseball, but in 2015, the federal government uh, decided for the most part to start um, kind of auditing partnerships at the partnership level rather than just the partner level. And so this is, they, I think um, this is language that has been agreed to by all of the groups now, and uh, a lot of work was done on that. Uh, just a couple other items in it. Um, there is a 
portion in here that uh, we have a property tax exemption for disabled veterans. If you're 100% disabled, you have a $300,000 exemption from property market value. If you're 70%, uh, it is 150,000. And what this allows is that a spouse, a surviving spouse of a deceased veteran uh, would be able to make one move out of that current house as long as it's of less value and still maintain the credit. Right now, a spouse of a deceased veteran maintains that, that credit, uh, but they have to stay in the house. This would allow them one transfer into another home of lesser value. And then there's also something that uh, some volunteer uh, drivers were being uh, taxed for reimbursements over a certain amount, and this would allow a subtraction for those folks. So that's um, kind of the main provisions in this bill, but it does address a major area, and this would be very beneficial uh, to our economy, right? When we need a real uh, boost, this would give our very fragile economy a boost with a lot of the provisions uh, that are in this bill. So I'm uh, open to any questions, Mr. Chair. Okay, and um, I'm going to, uh, there's two hands that are up and one I'm gonna rec recognize, uh, represent Hornstein first. I don't think his question or comment is on the tax provision, but I asked him when uh, Mr. Marks was uh, doing his presentation to wait for this bill. So uh, thank you for waiting, uh, Representative Hornstein, uh, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much, um, Mr. Chair. And uh, as I referenced earlier, um, I did want to uh, raise an issue around uh, trunk highway bonds uh, in, in the bill. And uh, perhaps maybe the commissioner, I, I know that she was uh, on earlier, if she's still on, I, I would just have a question for her about it. Um, you know, my concern is that when we uh, originally passed uh, the bill, we had $100 million in trunk highway bonds. That's up to $300 million now. Uh, including 84 million for state highway uh, construction and then a new uh, project development fund at 25 million. And so my concern, Mr. Chair, is that um, while I'm pleased that at least these projects, my understanding, are shovel ready, I think the, the Senate bill originally did not have had trunk highway bonds for projects that were not even shovel ready, so we couldn't even get the construction going and create the jobs and all the things with goals that we have in this bill for infrastructure. So at least that's positive. But my concern is that, um, uh, as Representative Torkelson had referenced earlier, uh, we do have some pressure on the trunk highway fund. And uh, it's kind of akin to a, a credit card uh, that we've maxed out on. And I think this will add some additional pressure to the fund. And, and I think without new revenue, we could really be facing some long-term problems here as we try to issue trunk highway bonds. So perhaps if the commissioner... Uh, could address that question, um, uh, I, I would appreciate it. Uh, Commissioner Kelleher, are you still with us? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative Hornstein. I'd be remiss if I didn't first say thank you to Chair Murphy and her staff for all the work that's been done on this bill already, and to the Senate members who have participated in the conversations around the bill. Chair Hornstein is correct, Mr. Chairman and members, that this bill does build pressure on the Trunk Highway Fund. To put it in context, there's over $623 million of funds that will go either to uh, local roads and bridges or to the Trunk Highway system. That is uh, a very good uh, thing in the bill. What it does do though, is it does increase the pressure on the Trunk Highway Fund. We have an internal debt policy that was uh, actually a legislative uh, directive a number of years ago to set a reasonable debt policy. It means that every when you're out buying your gasoline or buying your car, what happens is when that's deposited into the Trunk Highway Fund, MnDOT pays the debt service on any debt that is issued that's trunk highway debt. So it's a little different than the rest of this bill in the sense that MnDOT takes on that obligation. 
our limit is 20%, and that is deemed as our reasonable amount. This bill, uh, with the additional uh, spending in the Trunk Highway Fund, will put us at 17.7% in the year in the fiscal year 2025 and so chair hornstein and i know that uh representative torkelson is also concerned about this that what that means is we do need to pay attention to sustainable transportation funding in the future to be able to relieve that debt pressure so that we can get to these important projects that many members have wanted. And Chair Hornstein is also correct. We have worked very hard uh, with Chair Murphy, with the Senate, to make sure that these projects are as shovel ready as possible. So they are out in your communities and getting the work done and putting people back to work. We also have an innovation in this bill, which is the project development fund, which will also help MnDOT uh, be able to ready a number of important projects into the future that uh, can, uh, as we call it, the shelf of projects, be ready to go for a future funding. Thank you for the question. And Representative Bernstein. Yeah, and Mr. Chair, just to quickly conclude, and thank you, Commissioner, and I, I really appreciate your work, uh, particularly in, um, you know, making sure that a, the types of projects that are included are ones that will be available and ready to go. Uh, the original Senate bill did not have that, and so that's, a, that's an improvement. And I also want to thank uh, Chair Murphy. Uh, uh, Chair Murphy has been very consistent on this, and, and I think she understands also uh, the, the concerns that we have about the, 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 the Trunk Highway Fund, and, and I, I think that's why we had, I, I think, a more reasonable number in the original House bill, but uh, I understand why these, uh, these numbers have gone up, and, and, I, and, and I, again, appreciate the work of Chair Murphy and, and, and Commissioner Anderson Kelleher and uh, at least putting some guardrails on on this this new spending. So, um, you know, with that, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to, you know, uh, have my concerns on the record. And uh, uh, again, since we do have some projects that are ready to go, create jobs, make a difference in communities, you know, I, I can support it. But um, I think we really have to be uh, very aware of the long term impacts of of this kind of uh, trunk highway spending. Okay, thank you, Representative Hornstein. Uh, Representative Torkelson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, number one, uh, House Republicans had zero input into the final negotiation of these trunk highway bonds, or the entire bill for that matter. But I'm just gonna focus on the trunk highway bonds because it's an area I'm very concerned about. Uh, and it's, I've had very little time to digest just what this agreement really means. Uh, and uh, this particular fund that I have the first question about would be the project development fund. I don't know what that is. I don't know that we've had it in the past. I don't know how it's going to work. I don't know how projects are going to be selected. Uh, it's, it raises a lot of questions in my mind. and I would like at least some clarification at this point. Um, if you expect any Republicans to vote for this bill, uh, we would appreciate at least understanding what the heck is in it. Um, Mr. Chair, are you directing that question at the uh, commissioner? Mr. Chair, it's hard for me to direct a question when I have no idea what kind of an answer I expect and from whom I might get it. So I guess it's up to you, Mr. Chair, but I suggest that perhaps the commissioner may be your best well, choice. Well, perhaps uh, that would be my take, uh, but I wasn't sure if you were directing it uh, in another direction. Uh, commissioner Keller? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Representative Torkelson. So yes, this is uh, new language for a capital investment bill of a project development fund. These are projects that are not yet in our programmed four-year or 10-year program. Those are often referred to as the STIP and the CHIP, the State Transportation Investment Plan and the uh, Capital Highway Improvement Plan. The markers for how these projects will be selected is actually the MNSHIP 
program. Uh, that program is not uh, specific to project, but is categorical in nature. So it looks at things like economic uh, opportunity, economic development in an area as a way to identify those projects. And so it's tied back to Minship, which is a statutory program, which both uh, helps us in terms of making sure that we are following and having conversations with communities on the trunk highway system. There is 25 million in that uh, line item. And what I would say about that is the project development costs on many of the projects that you all hear about that lots of times MnDOT tells you, uh, we are not ready to go on that project needs usually somewhere between 12 and 15 percent uh, of the project into development work. That means environmental, that means readying the project uh, to get it ready to be shovel ready. That's been one of the debates I think we're all aware of with the Senate on transportation is the Senate has often been interested in uh, earmarking projects. This is not an earmark. This is a project development fund that will allow us to get a number of new projects ready to go to then uh, have them go through the processes that we need to do for a project. And I think members have a lot of needs out there. I know that from talking to many of the House members and many of the Senate members, these are all worthy projects. Uh, that I want to say, uh, but sometimes the projects are not ready. And in order to not tie up critical bond capacity, the project development fund is an innovation to be able to develop those projects. Chair Torkelson or, or Rep. Sam Torkelson, I don't know if that helps. Mr. Chairman? Rep. Sam Torkelson? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner, for that uh, clarification, for lack of a better term. So uh, who's going to select these projects? You know, the, the bottom line here seems to be a legislative input. Is this supposed to be an answer to gaining legislative input? Uh, am I going to get a, my own little wish list where I can select some projects? Or uh, how is this going to work? Commissioner? Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair and members, uh, you will be in the next, uh, uh, hopefully today, seeing a letter that will outline some of the examples of projects that could be funded through a project development fund and be able to be readied for shovel-ready uh, construction into the future. Uh, many of those projects are at various points along even getting ready for development. So uh, an example is anything in the metropolitan area, we need to work with our partners at the Metropolitan Council to make sure that those projects are in uh, the transportation investment uh, plan of the Metropolitan Council. So a number, you'll see some listed that are not in that category yet. And we need to work with our partners at Met Council to do that. It does say, the language says that it is in consultation with the Commissioner of MMB and the Commissioner of Transportation, uh, currently myself. But certainly, if this is uh, something that works as a program, that's going to go on into the future. So the Commissioner's Office would have uh, a role to play in the selection of those project development programs. Rep. Sam Torkelson. Well, Mr. Chair, I will try not to belabor this. Perhaps instead of calling it earmarking, we should call it ear piercing. I assume that's your concluding comment, uh, Rep. Sam Torkelson. Uh, Rep. Sam Hurtas. I think we're going Thank back. You, Mr. To Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was uh, wondering if, uh, after listening to uh, Representative Marquardt's presentation, if uh, Representative Davids could yield for a question. Uh, Representative Davids is uh, next on my list, but um, if you want to ask him a question now, fine. Representative Davids, are you live? I'm here. I'm here. Uh, I was going to recognize you next, but uh, Representative Hurtas has a question of you. That's Thank wonderful. you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Davids. You've uh, been in the legislature um, among some of the most senior members. I've served eight years. I've served on tax committee when you were chair. Um, I don't recall ever seeing a tax bill or a tax provision being put into the bonding bill. 
Uh, doesn't ha have you had any experience in your years here that the tax bills are put into a bonding bill? I think this violates the single subject clause. Chair Davis. Representative. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do not recall that. Representative uh, Hurt tossed that that's been done. And uh, when it comes to me for the questions, I'm going to be uh, asking House Research uh, if bonds could even be sold uh, since this is becoming a, a garbage bill by the second. Um, I don't believe, I believe that a bonding bill has to be single subject and it cannot have uh, all these other issues involved. But uh, that's a question I'll be asking here too. I, have I seen it? I don't recall it, uh, but I think we know what's really going on here, but uh, we'll let it play out. Okay, uh, Representative Hurtas. Said uh, thank, yeah, that did. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'll yield to uh, Chair Davids next. Okay, uh, Representative Davids, uh, maybe that maybe those were your comments, but did you have anything to add? Oh, I've got a lot to add. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. Uh, first of all, clearly we're violating the single subject world. Can we have someone from House Research comment if we can sell bonds on a bonding bill that's been loaded up with uh, items that don't apply? Um, trying to think of who the best uh, source for that question would be. Um, anybody want to come forward from House Research or from our fiscal staff, nonpartisan? Mr. Chair, this is Colby with House Research. Representative Sel or Mr. Sullivan. Yeah, I think to Representative David's question, ultimately Bond Council for the state of Minnesota will have to make a determination about the saleability of the bonds. Um, what comes to mind is the appropriation bonds that were issued to raise funding for the Minnesota Senate building. And those that bond authorization, I believe, was included in the tax bill, the omnibus tax bill in 2014, maybe 2013. So that's the precedent that comes to mind, but ultimately a uh, bond council We'll need to make a determination. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, sir. thank you, sir. And Mr. Chairman, is there some way we can have them uh, notify us as members? I mean, not today, obviously, but if this can even be done. Well, I guess I guess we don't need to do that because this bill is not going to pass anyway, so it's really going to be a moot point. Uh, but I remember two years ago when uh, the Republicans were in control and we put some uh, issues together, and my good friends on. Uh, your side of the aisle had a cat saying that this is filing single subject rule. This is the mother of all garbage bills. I would have said probably the father of all garbage bills. Uh, but members, it, this bill's not going anywhere. Uh, you don't have the votes to pass it. So uh, I don't know how long we belabor it, but a lot of problems with it. you're violating the single subject rule. Obviously, it's becoming a huge garbage bill. Uh, and I don't think you can sell the bonds with a bill that has all these unrelated issues in it, but I will be researching that. Well, I'm not going to research that issue because this bill's dead anyway. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Um, with that, um, somebody's voice. Mr. Chair, this is a uh, commissioner Franz. Okay. Uh, commissioner Franz. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, chair, Mr. Chair and uh, representative. I think one of the keys that uh, we have checked with council about uh, and amending into uh, bonding bill different issues. I think one of the things that happened several years ago was a tax bill uh, that started out as a tax bill was the idea to amend into that a bonding bill provision. So the key legal question for a bonding bill to get authority to pass, it has to start as a bonding bill, which this bill did, and then uh, amendments can be made into a bonding bill. Uh, the, the critical thing is that this is a bonding bill uh, that we're adding to. It's not another bill that we're adding bonding into. So that's one of the key ingredients to a uh, successful uh, bonding bill from that perspective. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, with that, uh, I don't see any more hands up. And I indicated earlier, I, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Representative Mark Court and Murphy for concluding comments. And then some hands went up and uh, uh, of course, I was going to recognize Representative Hornstein anyway, because he was on hold from before. But uh, with that, 
Representative Marquardt, uh, did that uh, conclude all of your comments relative to the tax provision? You want to put this in Samantha? Yes, uh, Mr. Chair. Yeah, that I'm completed with uh, basically the summary of the bill. But members, we are the only divided legislature in the nation. We have a Republican controlled Senate and a Democratic controlled House. And people around the state want to see us get the work done. And I think what has been accomplished here is we have an agreement in this divided legislature between a Republican controlled Senate and a Democratic controlled House uh, on a $1.85 billion capital investment bill. And we have an agreement between a Republican Senate and a Democratic House on a tax proportion or provisions in this bill that finally, after years and being a top priority and farm groups and business groups coming forward to say, solve the section 179 full expensing, we've done that. We have an agreement. And uh, this is what people around the state are looking for, not excuses, but to move forward with compromise, working together, bipartisan fashion. And that's what's been crafted here. And we have a great opportunity, and they don't always come together like this, to get some great investments done for our economy and for creating jobs and for our local units of, and for local projects but also to do a number of things in the tax policy that we've tried to do for years and I know has been a top priority for a lot of members. And section 179 full expensing, you talk to farmers, you talk to small businesses, they're looking for us to do this and they don't want excuses. They wanted us to work together in a bipartisan fashion and that's what's occurred here. And we have an excellent chance right now to really give our economy a boost in these very fragile economic times and also a way to benefit the quality of life for folks in every corner of the state. And we need that right now. So members, I, I ask that we pass this today out of ways and means and that we look beyond partisan politics and we look at this bipartisan agreement that's been reached and do what people not only expect us to do, but what people around the state of Minnesota deserve to get. And that's results that will help them uh, around the state as far as creating jobs and helping our economy and their quality of life. So uh, members, I, I ask for a yes vote on this. Okay, uh, thank, thank you, Representative Marquardt. And uh, I'll recognize now Representative Murphy, and then we will uh, be voting on the bill. Representative Murphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for committee members. Um, for the input that you've given today. This is a bill that came about because we listened to the people of Minnesota. We heard what the needs were and we received advice on what we should invest in to make life better for all Minnesotans for every region of the state and every local project that's proposed. There is a strong bond of people that see a need. We have emergencies in this state. We have needs to put Minnesotans to work. We have to make critical economic investments in order to deliver on the people's expectations of what we can give them. One of the things that we hear the most about in our campaigns for re-election, in our reports to the people of what we've done, is investments in higher education. The University of Minnesota and the Minnesota state system is waiting for this bill, for the investment in HEPR and new buildings and renovations. We are at the highest amount 
that they have ever achieved. People talked about clean water, wastewater, recycling on every single tour we took. We have the highest investment in clean water and wastewater programs that help every part of the state. We have roads and bridges investment. We have two major, er, a major bridge in St. Paul that's been put aside and put aside and put aside and put aside and put aside. We are funding it at $52 million. We have a dam in Northwest Minnesota. We are funding at $18 million. We are, cannot put some projects aside. Rail separations are killing, would kill people if there was an emergency. The investments for rail separations are high. We are saving lives if we invest in what the Minnesotan people have asked for. We can play politics if we want, but this is a bill that we should not pay, play politics on. We should meet the immediate needs of the people of this state, of the babies and the children and the teenagers and the young adults, and the growing families, and the senior citizens all have something in this bill. This is an investment in Minnesota's future. Please vote. Thank you. Uh, the clerk will take the roll. Mr. Chair, should I renew the motion? Oh, excuse me. Yes, uh, you should renew the motion. I renew my motion that House File 3, as amended, be recommended to be placed on the General Register. Any further discussion? Seeing none, the clerk will take the roll. Representative Carlson? Aye. Carlson, aye. Representative Olson? Aye. Olson, aye. Representative Garofalo? No. Garofalo, no. Representative Albright? No. Albright, no. Representative Bernardi? Aye. Bernardi, aye. Representative Davids? No. Davids, no. Representative Daphne? Daphne, aye. Daphne, aye. Representative Driskowski? No. Driskowski, no. Representative Eklund? No, aye. Eklund, aye. Representative Hamilton? No. Hamilton, no. Representative Hansen? Hansen, aye. Hansen, aye. Representative Hausman? Aye. Hausman, aye. Representative Hertoss? Hertoss, no. Hertoss, no. Representative Hornstein? Aye. Hornstein, aye. Representative Kresha? Kresha, no. Kresha, no. Representative Liebling? Liebling, aye. Liebling, aye. Representative Lilly? Lilly, aye. Lilly, aye. Representative Long? Aye. Long, aye. Representative Mariani? Mariani, aye. Representative Marquardt? Marquardt, aye. Marquardt, aye. Representative Nelson? Nelson, aye. Nelson, aye. Representative Noor? Aye. Noor, aye. Representative Pulowski? Pulowski, aye. Pulowski, aye. Representative Poppy? Poppy, aye. Poppy, aye. Representative Schumacher, excused. Representative Scott? No. Scott, no. Representative Torkelson? 
Torkelson, no. Torkelson, no. Representative Vogel? Vogel, no. Vogel, no. Representative Wagenius? Aye. Wagenius, aye. 18 ayes, 10 nays. The uh, motion uh, prevails and the uh, bill is on its way to the House floor. So uh, thank you, uh, Representative Marquardt. Of course, you're a member of the committee, so you'll be here for the balance. But uh, thank you, uh, Representative Murphy, uh, the chief author of the 